what I want to do in this session is uh, actually dive into how one would actually use microdata to better understand uh, global capital allocation. And I'm going to do, do, do so uh, mainly focusing in the context of uh, my joint paper with Brent and Matteo, International Currencies and Capital Allocation. And so Matteo alluded to this idea um, in his introductory session that kind of the most pro one of the most prominent patterns in international macro and international portfolio allocation is this idea of home bias, that investors are overweight their domestic securities. Uh, so beginning with French and Paterba and, and enormous literature, it's really been about trying to understand why investors are kind of so overweight their own equities. What we do in our work is we're going to use um, micro data to really dig deeper. We're going to look at um, basically the composition of international uh, bond investment. And in particular, we're going to establish the importance of currency in shaping global portfolios. So what we're going to argue is that it's really this um, you know, tendency of investors to buy um, bonds denominated in their own currency that's going to explain a lot of the patterns of cross-border investment. And so mostly I'm going to focus in this kind of first module of how we can actually use the micro data to establish that fact. And then in the second module, I'm going to walk through the, the consequences of that, trying to understand how this investor home currency bias is actually going to kind of change the shape of which firms access capital and um, you know, kind of the benefits of issuing the international currency. And so Brent kind of walked through the uh, kind of aggregate data, the international investment position data, the net foreign asset position data. We start from a micro data set from Morningstar. So you know, if any of you own mutual funds, you might be familiar with Morningstar from you know, the kind of ratings that they put on a mutual fund for or five stars. What we use is the data from them, which is basically the individual portfolio holdings, the individual securities that mutual funds around the world own. And so we can cover investors from 10 different developed markets. And actually beginning from the security level, we can go all the way from individual security holdings all the way up to around $33 trillion of wealth um, of worldwide mutual fund and ETF positions. What's particularly important uh, kind of for us, and I, and I think uh, really as you think of your own research going forward, is kind of the power you have when you begin with a security level data set going for questions in, in international macro. So let me kind of explain um, what I mean by that. So the structure of the data and kind of most um, data sets on you know, portfolio investment, stocks and bonds, there's going to be a security level identifier. In our case, that's the, the QCIP uh, nine. It's the nine digit code that basically uniquely identifies a security. You could start with an ISIN or kind of another uh, security level identifier. But the key is that from this uh, individual position, you can kind of recover the kind of macro, um, you know, macro variables like the country uh, of where security is issued, uh, like you would in the, in the home bias literature, but you can also use it to kind of dig deeper into the other components of investment. So in particular here, I've I've kind of listed an example QCIP of a 10-year bond issued by uh, the Petrobras International Finance Company. It's a US dollar denominated 10-year bond from January of 2022. And so if you look at the code, what this will give you is um, basically the first uh, six digits here. That's the issuer, something that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit later today. That's not actually going to be the firm. It's going to be the entity actually issuing the security. The issue, the next two digits, are basically going to say this is the particular um, security being issued. Now, what's important about having a security level information is, you know, so the Morningstar data will tell us things like the name of the security, um, importantly, the market value of what's being owned and a whole bunch of useful characteristics. But when you begin with a security level information, you can essentially merge in whatever information you'd like. So we're going to focus on currency, but you could also have maturity, industry, the underwriter, the market of issuance, the law of issuance. Be when you begin like this, you can really kind of dig into what's driving an aggregate pattern. And so let me show you how we do that for one particular aggregate pattern in our work, which is how different is the currency composition of investment that you know, households and mutual funds make when they invest money domestically versus how money is allocated when foreigners invest. And so this is looking at the currency composition of um, corporate bond investment for uh, here I've listed nine uh, developed markets, Australia, Canada, Switzerland, Denmark, the Euro area, Great Britain, uh, Norway, New Zealand, and Sweden. So let's look here at the Canada line here. What this is saying is that when Canadian mutual funds 
invest domestically, by domestic Canadian corporate debt, you know, over 90% of those securities are actually in Canadian dollars. And you see across the board that when uh, domestic investment of any of these countries are made, it's overwhelmingly in the country's local currency. But here in the blue bars, you can see when foreigners actually invest, say in Canada here, you know, under 10% of the bonds they buy of Canadian firms are actually issued in Canadian dollars. So across the board, when foreigners invest, even in these uh, developed market economies, they overwhelmingly avoid the local currency. Now, there's one huge um, exception to this, and that's actually gonna be the United States, where overwhelmingly when foreign investors buy the bonds issued by American firms, they do so uh, in the US dollar. Now, you can also flip this and look at when investors buy securities abroad, just outside of their uh, country, how much of what they buy is in say the dollar or their home currency. So again, if you look at the Canada uh, bar here, what this is saying is that when Canada invests abroad, nearly 50% of what it buys is in uh, US dollars. And then there's gonna be another say 25% of it that's in Canadian dollars. Um, but very little of that is actually going to be in um, you know, any third uh, currency. And importantly, this is actually excluding any investment in the United States. So overwhelmingly, when each of these countries goes abroad and it buys a security, it does so either in its own currency or in US dollars. Now, this is the kind of picture, it's difficult to make using aggregate data, but you can kind of get close uh, to it. But right now, everything I've shown you you can't rule out a story of, well, maybe the composition of foreign and domestic investment is different because of compositional effects. Maybe what it is is that foreigners and domestic investors are lending to different sectors, they're lending to different firms. Maybe this isn't actually currency, maybe it's something about um, you know, the other nature of investment. And so that's where you can really kind of see the power of beginning, uh, of you know, having the micro data to unpack these aggregate um, findings. And so in particular, uh, what we do is in order to identify the importance of currency, we're gonna ask the question of how much more of a bond does an investor buy issued by the same firm if it's in its own currency, if it's in the investor's own currency than it would if it was in any other currency. And so what we do is we run a security level regression that basically asks uh, the left-hand side variable is the share of any given security C. So this is an individual bond that's issued by firm P that's held by um, investors in country I. And so the kind of currency, um, you know, the, the main um, coefficient we're interested in is this beta. How much more of a security do you own if the security is in the investor's currency? And importantly, we do this with a firm fixed effect. So we're always going to identify this importance of currency using two bonds issued by the same firm. And we can have other kind of security level controls like uh, maturity and coupon. And so what you can see here is that overwhelmingly there's kind of a huge effect of currency. So if you look at the coefficient for Canada, this is saying that if a security is issued in Canadian dollars, Canada will account for essentially 90% or 90% more of the security of the amount outstanding than it would if it were in any other currency. And that's gonna be the case uh, kind of the, you know, here I only report four, the Euro area, Great Britain and the US, but across the board for our countries, you kind of find this strong home currency, um, home currency bias. Now, again, using the, the micro data, what you can really do is then say, what else could I have missed at the um, bond level that could have explained this effect? And so this is kind of where, again, we're beginning with the micro data can really help you we can kind of do this exact same regression, but split for multi-currency issuers only, financial firms only, non-financial firms, foreign financial firms, foreign non-financial firms. Uh, we can look at um, structured finance, sovereign nationals. We can control for the residency of where security is issued. We can control for the governing law. And so that's the idea of, you know, we pick some, but you can imagine that each of these characteristics would, would kind of form the basis of trying to understand um, an investment portfolio. Now, the other thing we can uh, we then turn to is say, you know, I began the talk by talking about how this home country bias, how much um, investors are overweight securities of their of their own firms. We want to ask how much of that can kind of be explained by uh, home currency bias. How much is currency? Uh, how much can currency explain relative to um, country? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to run a similar regression framework, 
but we're going to look at three different um, specifications. We're basically going to include, we're going to ask how much of a security does investors own just if the security has been issued by a firm in the investor's country. We're going to say, what if it's issued in the investor's home uh, currency? And what if there's both um, a home country and, and home currency? What actually explain this effect? Now, to be clear, in this regression, it's kind of less clean. And the reason for that is we can't have any firm fixed effects because home country here, that's not something that's going to vary within the firm. And I should say, um, so on the website, um, we've actually written up um, kind of a, a, a little problem set exercise where you can run a version of this regression using the disaggregated uh, splits that we produced um, you know, from this data um, that we put on globalcapitalallocation.com that can basically run through um, this regression using slightly more aggregated data. Now, when we actually turn to um, run this regression, what do we find? So the first thing we do is say just how much of the variation in country level portfolios can be understood by just country alone. And you can see that the answer is a lot of it. You know, home, you know this is why um, you know, home bias is a, you know, a pretty prominent um, you know, uh, topic of study in international macro. You can see that this one characteristic alone can explain, so for Canada, it can explain 40% of the variation in Canada's entire um, bond portfolio, just knowing whether or not a security is issued by a Canadian firm. But Using the microdata, what you can do is ask the kind of similar question of how much of Canada's portfolio can be explained by just looking at the currency of a security. And here you can see that the orders of magnitude are, you know, the explanatory power is much higher. So knowing just the currency in which a security is issued uh, can explain, you know, 92% of Canada's bond market portfolio. Knowing that securities in Canadian dollars is really going to explain how much of it um, a Canadian owns. Now, in the kind of third set of regressions, what we can do is run both simultaneously. We can ask, well, how much, if you include both a dummy for the country where a security is issued and the currency in which it's issued, um, where does the variation come from? And you can see uh, that overwhelmingly um, kind of the coefficient on currency is maintained and the coefficient on country is strongly attenuated towards zero. And so essentially conditional on knowing the currency in which a security is issued, knowing the country of the firm that issued it is actually going to give you very little additional information about who owns the security. And so now here I want to pause um, and kind of take any questions and discuss this. And what I'm going to do in the second part of uh, this module is basically say, okay, now that we've kind of shown in this investor home currency bias, what is that actually going to mean for the question of who gets capital uh, across countries and, and around the world? Thank you.